Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you. As Pastor, Elder, Raphael? Pastor Raphael. Okay, either or. Pastor Elder Raphael has already talked about being battle buddies for sure. All the sentiments that he just shared very kindly. Um, Grace Church feels the exact same way. All of us living in Miami, there are not a whole lot of healthy churches here. We're working towards that to build more, to plant more churches, but knowing that there's other congregations of faithful Christians in this city ministering alongside us that we can lock arms with, we're so incredibly grateful for that. So even a couple weeks ago at worship night, um, it was just hosted in Miami Shores with Ben and with many of you, just really, really fun and encouraging to know that we're not alone. You guys aren't alone. We aren't alone. We don't need to feel like Elijah in the wilderness. God, is there anybody else? I was like, no, I have my, I have my faithful here. So thankful for that. I do wish that uh, we could be here under different circumstances. Of course, we've been praying for David Bush and his family. And while that pain and grief and mourning that they are going through right now is very real, they're also undergird by that joy, knowing that his mother was in Christ, that she's with her Savior today, which is the same hope that we have. When I was a teenager, um, I grew up in Indianapolis, and I worked on a building maintenance crew at a 13-story building in downtown Indianapolis that had been converted into a training center for other things. As a teenager, I was given all the jobs that nobody else wanted. So I had to repair the vacuum cleaners, switching out bearings on the beater bars, I had to switch out the wax rings on the toilets, replacing thermostats on the air conditioners, things of that nature. I also worked with several other teenagers, and while we were pretty busy with the maintenance request for the building because it was large, we had about 500 people living there, we also found that there was pockets of time that we were bored and we had nothing to do. And as teenagers were wont to do, we wanted to find something, we wanted to do something, spend our time well. We had master keys to the building, which was a very dangerous thing. So we would, we would explore the building, we'd find things to do. One of the things that were interesting about this building was there actually, there's four elevators in this building, three of them for passengers, there, you access them in the lobby, and then there was one elevator in the back, the service elevator. This was used for like the cleaning crews, for taking out the trash and whatnot. So we decided to play with the elevator that day. I don't know who was supervising us or how we were able to do this, but we did this. We took that elevator and we locked it out the second floor and we wanted to see what the elevator shaft looked like open from the top. So again, this is a 13-story building. So we locked it out the second floor, then we went up to the 13th floor, we went to that elevator door and we opened the door to look into the shaft and the shaft went all the way down. It was about 100 feet. There was nothing there except for a solitary incandescent light bulb that was on at the top of the car and then about six elevator cables that were running up through the center of that elevator shaft up to the elevator room that was on the roof. That was not interesting enough for us. We had to decide what we were going to do with this elevator shaft now. <laughs> so we talked about, well, would it, it would be really cool if we slid down the cables to the elevator car. No, that would be dangerous. That's stupid. We shouldn't do that. But we're teenage boys, and we kept egging each other on, and it was I that decided that I would go ahead and try this for us. So armed with ignorance, stupidity, and two jersey knit gloves, I reached in and grabbed one of those cables, holding on to the door outside, reached in and grabbed one of those cables, holding on to the door outside, I wanted to see what that would be like. 100 feet down, looking down, reached in, then have a choice. I said, I'm going to do this. So I let go of this hand, I reach in, so now I'm leaning in, hands on both those cables, I swing my legs in, and I'm there. I'm hanging 100 feet in the air in an elevator shaft, hanging onto two cables. And then I slowly let my hands go. I start to descend a lot faster than I was planning on descending. I was ignorant of many things. One of those things was how quickly friction creates heat. And my hands started to burn. They started to burn real bad. And I knew that if I didn't do something or change something, I was going to irreparably damage my hands. My father has put a lot of money into these hands in the form of piano lessons, so I needed to protect them. 
So I grabbed onto the cables, and I stopped at about eighth floor, halfway down, and I'm just hanging there and trying to figure out what to do. My feet are now tangled in the cables, not sure what to do. My hands cool down, and then slowly I let myself down. I'm able to get all the way down to second floor, and I'm safe. God was very kind that day. It wasn't until after, though, that day was finished that I realized how much danger I had put myself in, how dumb that was. I could have slipped. Just swinging into the cables alone was super dangerous. Once I was stopped in the middle, even if I fell from there, at best I would have shattered both my legs, probably died. Not only did I put myself in an incredible amount of danger, I was also a really, really dumb example to those other teenage boys that were standing up top that were watching me slide down this elevator shaft. They could have swung in right after me and tried to do the same thing. If one of them had slipped and fallen, what would I have said to their family? So the danger I had put myself in and the danger I had also put my friends in was something that I did not realize the seriousness of. Today, I want us to look at the Bible and look at those two separate things, how we put other people at danger and also ourselves in danger by not understanding the seriousness of sin. Us not recognizing how serious God sees sin. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to open to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we will be in verses 42 through 50. I'll give you a second to get there. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The first point that I want us to look at this morning is the seriousness of stumbling blocks. The seriousness of stumbling blocks. Now, the the phrase stumbling blocks and also cause someone else to sin, I'm going to use those interchangeably this morning because they mean the same thing. To cause someone else to sin is to place a stumbling block in front of someone and vice versa. Underneath that heading of the seriousness of stumbling blocks, I first want to look at, like we talked about, a danger, being a danger to other people, which I'm entitling, contributing to the delinquency of a sinner. We see this in verse 42. Read verse 42 with me again. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Okay, so what do we have going on in this verse? If someone were to cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, the little ones, who's he talking about? It's possible that the little ones is referring to children that Jesus was referring to earlier in this chapter in verse 37. It's definitely a fine interpretation. I'm not sure that's that's true or that's what is happening there. Mark is written in a unique way in that there's snapshots of these small stories that he's linking together to give a bigger picture. It could mean the disciples, it could mean followers of Jesus, but it doesn't really change the main point, the main thrust of this verse that Jesus is trying to push forward, which is to be a stumbling block to those that are putting their faith in him, to those that believe in him. The second half of this verse, whoever would cause these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better that a millstone were tied around his neck and he would be thrown into the sea. What does that mean? What is a millstone? I don't have one in my backyard. I doubt you guys do either. But this would have been something very common for Jesus' 
people that he was talking to, the disciples in particular, that they would have understood. As an agricultural culture, they did crops and they did livestock. That's how they took care of themselves. That's how they ate. That's how they survived. And when they would have harvest, they would bring in this grain. And to make the grain into a different form that would be easier for them to make food with and for other uses, they need to crush it. Well, crushing it by hand is really, really hard. So they developed what was called a millstone. It was this device where they'd have a stone plate on the bottom. It was circular. They'd spread the grain on top, and then they'd have this heavy, conically shaped stone on top that they would drag around in a circle, and it would crush the grain for them, and it would be in a form that they could use. It was a heavy, heavy stone. It would usually be turned by either human power, by oxen, something like that. While we are not familiar here in Miami with millstones, we are familiar with water, either with our pools or in the ocean. And everyone knows to swim, weight is not your friend. Even swimming with a pair of shoes on is difficult. So imagine a 100-pound stone wrapped around your neck and you jump into the ocean. What is going to happen? You're going to make a world record hitting the bottom. And I don't care how strong of a swimmer you are, you're not coming back up. Jesus is using hyperbolic language. He's using extreme language here to get the attention of his audience, to get to the, t- the attention of his disciples, to show them how dangerous it is to be a stumbling block to others. He uses this hyperbolic language because we don't usually think this way. We understand that sin is a bad thing, but a danger to other people, is it really that big of a deal? Where does sin end? James chapter 1 tells us that sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. So the hyperbolic language that Jesus is using there when he says it would be better if a person had a millstone hung around their neck and then thrown into the sea, that doesn't feel as hyperbolic anymore, does it? Because to cause someone else to sin is to lead them on the path to death because that is where sin ends. He's trying, God, Jesus himself, is trying to explain to us the seriousness of sin that when we switch out, when we downplay sin and say it's not that big of a deal, we're actually leading other people towards death. Now, we may think, I don't think I really do that. I'm not going around and telling people sin is okay. And you don't need the gospel, and you don't need a savior. Well, most of us in this room probably identify ourselves as Christians, and we don't do that. Sin is generally accepted, even by non-Christians, as something that's not great. However, let's think about this a little bit more. With the words that we use, and with our behaviors, are there sins that we let creep in, and we're just like, yeah, this isn't really that big of a deal. I feel like I'm doing better than the people around me. I'm doing better than I was before. I haven't murdered anyone. And then with our behavior and with our actions and with our words, especially when we're around fellow Christians, those younger in the faith, those more impressionable, then we can unknowingly, possibly even not on purpose, tell those that are around us that, no, this, this behavior is fine. Sin is actually okay. And this is dangerous. We can be a stumbling block to others. and At the same time, we can also be a stumbling block to ourselves. Not only do we contribute to the delinquency of other sinners around us, but our point B under the seriousness of stumbling blocks is this. That sin is the ultimate self-harm. Sin is the ultimate self-harm. Turn again with me to Mark chapter 9. We're going to read verses 43 to 48. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye and with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. 
So we can be not only a stumbling block to other people, we can actually be a stumbling block to ourselves. Jesus is again using that extreme language to show us the seriousness of sin. Now this extreme language, he's saying, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your foot offends you, cut it off. Those of you in the room that are Christians, we realize that indwelling sin is a reality for us, right? Sadly, it is. Even after coming to faith in Christ, we still live in sin. So if we were to live this passage out, literally, all of us would be in here with no feet, no hands, no eyes. Thankfully, Jesus is not literally telling us that that is what we need to do. But he is telling us that is how we need to think about sin. We need to go at war with sin for the same reason that we need to be careful with our lives around other people. Because sin for others, while that leads to death, it will also lead to death for us. Sin is a dangerous thing. And it is much better to cut something off, to cut something out of our life, to get away from that sin, than it is to live in that sin and to be okay with that sin. Sin does not usually come at us like a sledgehammer in the head. Sin usually comes at us quietly. It's sneaky. Satan is sneaky, and most of all, our hearts are sneaky. They're deceitful, deceitful and desperately wicked. Um, as Pastor Raphael was talking about earlier, we do have two children. They are 15 and 12. If you thought we were too young to be married for 16 years, most people think we're too young to have a 15-year-old. I also think that we are too young to have a 15-year-old. She's going, she's going to be a sophomore this year, and that's nuts to me. We watch movies together on Friday night. One of the movies that we enjoy together is the original Wizard of Oz. And in the story of the Wizard of Oz, if you've either read it or if you've seen it, they come out of the forest and they enter this poppy field. They're on their way to the Emerald City. They get into this poppy field and it's beautiful. As they're hiking through, they slowly get tired and sleepy. They're like, we need to lay down. This field is beautiful. Let's lay down and let's take a break on our way to the Emerald City. But what they don't realize is that the wicked witch of the West has actually poisoned this poppy, poppy field. All these beautiful flowers caused to make them feel sleepy and then to kill them. Sin does the same thing to us. It slowly lulls us in. It's very rare that we just choose, yep, today I'm going to have an affair. It doesn't work that way. We slowly get pulled in, slowly get sucked into sin, and we slowly justify those things in our minds until sin takes us way farther than we ever wanted it to. And it ends up holding us way longer than we wanted to stay. We need to be serious about sin. We need to cut it out of our lives because of the danger it is to us. Now, you may be sitting here and saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but I still struggle with sin. Is, is that not a reality for us? Do we not have indwelling sin? Like, I don't understand what you're saying here. Unrepentant, habitual sin is the main thing that we need to be careful of in this. We need to cut all sin out of our life. But the reason unrepentant, habitual sin in our life is most dangerous is because it can be a sign that we're not actually in Christ. I believe you guys have recently been going through the epistles of John on your Sunday mornings. The entire book of 1 John is written about this. There's a stark contrast between Loving God or loving sin it can be a child of the light or a child of darkness. If we are living in habitual, unrepentant sin, it can be a sign that we are not in Christ. This is one of the reasons that Jesus gave us the tool of church discipline in Matthew, Matthew 18. is so that out of love, we go to one another and we confront one another, caring for their souls because we're worried, Christians, we don't live like this. And if we do, it could very well be a sign that we're actually not in Christ. Sin leads to death, and we need to be serious about it. The seriousness of sin, though, while this passage is trying to recalibrate us, Jesus is coming to us and he's saying, no, this is how bad sin is. This is how serious it is. That may shock us, but it really shouldn't, right? After all, isn't this why Jesus came to die in the first place? 
because of the seriousness of our sin. God created this world perfect and without any issue, but Adam and Eve and every human being after them, we have rebelled against God by choosing sin over God. We've said, God, it's not your truth that I want, it's my truth that I want. I'm going to decide what is right and what is wrong, what is evil and what is good. I've got this. Thank you for everything else, but I can figure out, figure out the rest on my own. And what we've chosen by doing that, we've chosen by rejecting God's definition of what is good and what is evil, we've chosen sin, and therefore we've chosen death. But God, in his mercy and his grace and his love and his kindness, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, first of all, to live a life that we have all failed at, to glorify God in perfection, securing righteousness for his people. Then he died on the cross. The death we deserve, the death that we should die ourselves, he took that on himself. He not only died to satisfy that punishment, but then three days later he rose again. He rose again to do two things. One, to prove he is who he says he is. He is the son of God. And second, that he has the power to forgive sins and to raise us from the dead. He can raise himself, can he not raise us? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If there's no resurrection, what hope do we have? But Jesus Christ is a risen Savior, and he sits now at the throne of God. It is the seriousness of our sin that brought Jesus Christ to this earth to die for us and to secure salvation for us. should not surprise us. The consequences of our sin, Jesus drives home a little bit more in this verse 48. He says, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus talks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. If you're tempted to believe that there's no way that God would create hell, or there's no way that hell is real, or it must just be a picture of something else. No, Jesus is very clear, both here in Mark 9 and in other passages, that hell is a very real place. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. As we're reading through these verses, you may notice that we're missing a couple verses. We're missing verses 44 and 46. It skips from 43 to 45, It skips from 45 to 47. Your Bible is not broken. You do not have a defective version. What has happened here is over time, as we've discovered more older and older manuscripts, Bible scholars have tried to make sure that we have the most accurate version of the Bible that we can have. And they've discovered that some of those earliest manuscripts do not include verses 44 and 46. So your next question may be, well, what am I missing here? What was in those verses 44 and 46 that I don't have? Do I not have a complete Bible? Verses 44 and 46, those manuscripts that included them, are an exact verbatim copy of verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So you're not missing anything. Your Bible's fine. You don't have to go out and buy another one. But what Jesus is doing here in, in verse 48, when he says the worm will not die and the fire is not quenched, he's actually quoting Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, in the context of that is he's actually speaking about the final judgment, how judgment is coming and how it is real. And this takes us to verse 49. And verse 49 says this, For everyone will be salted with fire. This is honestly a mysterious verse, pretty enigmatic verse. The, the meaning of it is not immediately clear. But I think Jesus is following his line of thought and saying, for everyone will be salted with fire. After he's speaking of that final judgment, the judgment is coming, that fire is coming. And that salting is this purification process where everyone's true colors will be shown. Everyone no matter how much money you have, no matter where you came from, no matter how good of a person you were, final judgment is coming. And we'll all be salted with it. And we've talked about the seriousness of stumbling blocks, the seriousness of sin, how we can be a danger to others, how we're a danger to ourselves. Finally, let's look at point number two, which is stay salty. If you're scared, don't worry, we only have two points. Um, I know point one was long, but we only have two. Let's stay salty. Let's read verse 50 together. Salt is good, but if the salt 
has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. All right, we were talking about millstones in verse 42. We were talking about cutting off limbs in other verses, 43 through 48. Now we're talking about salt. What is Jesus doing here? Well, most of you are probably familiar with that word picture that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 5 of his people, his followers, being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He's picking up on that theme that he's used in other places here, talking about being salt. Salt, for us, is a cheap commodity. You can get it for next to nothing. We use it as seasoning. That's about it. For the people back then, salt was a pretty important thing. You see, they didn't have modern refrigeration. Food went bad quickly. They would use salt as a preserving agent, especially for meat. What Jesus is saying when he's saying that we are to be salt of the earth, he's saying that our lives lived as ambassadors of Christ, us living out the gospel actually has a preserving effect on those around us. We're ambassadors to Christ through how we live. Therefore, for our lives to be salty means to live in a Christ-like manner, to represent Christ well, to represent our Savior well. When we lose that saltiness, we lose that reputation around us. That's when we start living a sinful life. We start living a life that does not honor Christ well. And therefore, that preserving effect that we have on those around us, us being an ambassador and a witness for Christ, loses its effectiveness. We're to have a God-glorifying and witnessing effect in this world. Now, I want to be clear what it means to be salt and what it doesn't mean to be salt. To be salt in this world does not mean that we go around saying to everyone, I live this way, and you should too. What can quickly happen when we say this, or when we think it, and we live accordingly, I live this way, and you should too. We are no longer sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. We're sharing a gospel of morality. If you do good enough, if you do what I do, if you live your life the right way, if you try hard enough, you can kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you'll be okay. God will understand when you get to the end, you can just point to everything that you did. Look, I live like a Christian should live, and I'm fine now. Jesus speaks to this directly. He says, there will be many people that do many things in my name, but then I will say to them, I never knew you. It's not what we do. We, do not, we want to be very careful that we do not call people to a gospel of morality. Instead of saying, I live this way and you should too, we say, I live this way because of what Jesus Christ has done in my life. We call people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to a gospel of morality. They don't need to do better. They need Christ. They can't do better. And to tell people that they can do better is going back to verse 42, tying a millstone around their neck and throwing it into the sea. We're giving them a burden that they can't possibly carry. We're telling them to climb a mountain that they can't climb, and we can't either. It is very possible that if we are living a life that says, I live this way and you should too, that we're actually believing a false gospel ourselves. I'm good enough. I've got this on lock. I know what Jesus expects from me, and I'm doing it all. If that is the way you think, and it's pretty rare that we actually say these words, but we definitely think it sometimes. Check your heart. Remind yourself of the gospel. Preach yourself the gospel again. And as you continue to live in that gospel, others will see that around you. You will be the salt because you're an ambassador for Christ and his gospel, not your own. Now at the end of this verse, it says, be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. At first blush, this feels like it's a bumper sticker that's slapped on the end of this chapter. Like, what is this even doing here? I don't understand. Hmm. Also, as you guys have been going through those epistles of John, do you remember what it says at the end of 1 John? Little children, keep yourself from idols. That also feels weird, right? It's not out of place. It completely is in context, if you understand what he's saying there. But this can kind of feel the same way. Be at peace with one another. What is he saying? 
All right, so we're called to be salt, but we're called not to be a Karen. (laughs) I'm going to explain this meme, uh, and then we're going to move forward. So being a Karen, if you are not familiar with, this is, this is something that's been popular on the internet for several years now. But to be a Karen, the stereotypical Karen would be a middle-aged woman with a bad haircut that likes to go into retail centers or restaurants or something like that looking for something that she doesn't like and immediately calling for the manager, for it to be fixed. And if I don't get what I want, then I'm going thermonuclear. What that attitude shows, it's saying, I know how this should be, and I go into a place knowing what it should be, and I want everybody to change to serve me, to do what I need right now. We're going to be salt in this world. We're not to be Karens. So another temptation for us as we live in society, as we live, honestly, around a lot of non-Christians, we see people living non-Christian lives. And for whatever reason, we think this is wrong. We're surprised that non-Christians are living like non-Christians. As if we didn't do the same thing before we came to Christ. When we live with non-Christians around us, expecting them to live like Christians, even though they don't even have the ability to do that because they don't have Christ, how unloving is that? Instead of being a Karen to those around us, to be salt is again to call them to the gospel of Jesus Christ to respond to them with the compassion, with the love and the forgiveness that we've been given through Christ, and to live that out as we share the gospel with them. So today we've looked at the seriousness of stumbling blocks, the importance of how we live our lives around others because of the danger we can put them in and the danger we can put ourselves in. The flip side, we're not just to keep ourselves from sin, we're also to live these salty lives, these preserving lives as ambassadors for Christ, understanding what he says is true, what he says is evil, and living accordingly. May we do this as we go into our relationships with our families, as we're in our workplaces, as we go out into this world this week, keeping ourselves from evil, but as cliche as it sounds, staying salty. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it is authoritative. We thank you that you tell us how we should live. God, help us to live in the gospel. As we've done together this morning, through the reading of your word, through prayer, through singing, God, reminding ourselves of what is true. Help us to live in light of that, of what is true. That we'd reject what our hearts tell us is real, and we would believe what you tell us is real. That we would live, God, as you would have us live. That we would be salt to this earth. And as we prayed earlier today, that you would save your people from their sins. That you would start here in this church. It would spread abroad to Miami, to our state. God, we pray that you would save souls. We know you can. We know you can because we've experienced it firsthand. You have exchanged our hearts of stone for hearts of flesh, and we praise you for it. Help us to respond to others with the same gospel principles as you have pursued us with, Lord. Bless this church. Bless its leadership. Bless its people. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.